Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have a, a great panel here today to talk about the idea of content and social as currency. How do you leverage content? How do you leverage social? Um, <clears throat> especially in a setting where you have uh, so many regulations and so many rules and so many people who need to buy into everything that you're doing, um, which can you know, typically take weeks, months, quarters, years, however long it takes, and now you're operating in an environment where you're expected to operate uh, on a, you know, a real-time basis. So we have a, a terrific panel up here, folks, who are going to walk you through uh, what stage they are at in the social and content uh, game, talk a little bit about lessons they've learned, uh, lessons they're still learning. Um, and the takeaway should be real uh, things that you can take back to your own companies um, to help think about how you do content, how you work with social. And we'll, uh, they'll be taking your questions, too, at the end. So uh, let me introduce myself. Should have done that at the beginning. I'm Dan Roth. I'm the executive editor of LinkedIn. So I oversee all content coming in and going out of LinkedIn, which includes our influencer product, uh, which is where we have 260 thought leaders talking about what's going on in the world of business, nonprofit, anything in the professional realm. Um, and spent a lot of time thinking about content every day, what's working, what's not working. And, and one of the things that I think we've discovered is the power of conversation, that it's not just that content is king, conversation really is the new king. And um, so with that, let's kick it over to, uh, to, to the panel. And uh, I'll let each of you introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about the com your company. And uh, if you could also say, kind of on a scale of one to five, five being you are absolutely nailing content. You are, you know, the Lady Gaga of, of FinServ. Uh, you're five, and if you're one, you are just signing up for, uh, you know, for for for, for Twitter, and and, you're, and you and you just heard about Pinterest from your kids. So, let's start with you, Paul. Uh, and it's so odd for me to go first because my last name is Zettel. Um, <laughs> So Paul Zettel, I work at TD Ameritrade, and I'm responsible for two functions, um, retail marketing planning, and I also have social media uh, marketing. And um, we, you know, we just started this, this social journey um, a couple years ago. And in terms of content, there are areas where we are, I, I would say, very advanced in terms of print publications and having a magazine and doing some really edgy things. Bringing those over as a broker-dealer, um, it's, it's exciting. I'm a, I'm a hard grader. I'd say we're probably around a, a six or a seven. Great, on a scale of one to five. Yeah. You're, you're oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I, I said one to ten. And I can't spell or add. Um, a three. Three, all right, great. Linda? <laughs> Hi everyone, Linda Descano. Uh, I'm with Citibank and I run all of our content and social media marketing for the consumer businesses in the US. Um, you know, our job is really how to bring the city brand to life um, across the social platform, both on us, so the branded properties that we, we manage, but then how do we leverage content um, to spark social conversations wherever consumers are gathering and, and talking um, across the, the digital cloud. I would say in some areas we're probably a, a four, and in other areas we're a two. Um, because this is something that you're constantly learning and evolving, and as all of you know, being in our industry, um, you have to take small steps when you're highly regulated, especially given the environment that we've just come through in an uncertain regu uh, regulatory and compliance environment. But I'm really proud of some of the work we've done with women, both with our Women in Co property, which is 13 years old and has been you know, talking and engaging in conversation since 2000, um, but also with the sponsored group that we have on LinkedIn. I think those are just two examples, and what we're trying to do is how do we apply them to different audiences and to talk about a range of topics. Great. Michael. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Feigenbaum. I'm actually from here from London. I work for Barclays, and they're in the Wealth Investment Management Division. So. Um, Picking up on what Linda just said, it's slightly different. We look after high net worth, ultra high net worth clients with 50 million plus in, uh, in our accounts. But also we look after what we call execution only clients. Those are those that want to do brokerage 
so trading what we call buying ISAs and SIPs in, in British lingo now, um, where we service them just in the online space. And it's a, it's a huge group when you think about the ultra high net worth, very sophisticated people, don't have any time whatsoever. And then the mom and pop who sit at home who, who want to engage with us uh, digitally. So for us, social media tries to span that entire spectrum and where we want to engage with them in very meaningful ways, be it talking about unlocking the female economy or talking about thought leadership pieces where it's about the correlation between playing golf and risk or thinking about the entrepreneurs, what's, what do they care about and having, having sat in Scott Scott session earlier from American Express on, on Open Forum, of course, I'm very intrigued and, and interested in something like that. So what have I learned? Uh, well, we're truly global. So a one size fits all doesn't work. And if I'm sitting here now in New York, the, the, the headache that I have here is slightly different than one I have when I'm back home in London. And that is regulation, compliance, etc. But if I think about our clients and colleagues in Dubai or in Singapore, it's again completely different. So trying to fit this all under one umbrella, but yet uh, ensure we do this in a, in a very meaningful way so we don't alienate clients, but we engage with them because they want to engage with us. That's what social media, in my view, is all about. They come to engage with us. They, they proactively choose to engage with us on LinkedIn and Facebook. So that's the biggest challenge we have. Great. My name is Lisa Shallot. I'm at Goldman Sachs, and I head uh, brand marketing and digital strategy. Uh, I do this for the corporate brand. My group sits in the executive office and is one of a number of uh, departments. So uh, I work very closely alongside our media relations effort, our internal communications effort, our investor relations effort, et cetera. Uh, so it's a very collaborative approach. And I would say our group is more like a B2B oriented focus than it is a B2C oriented focus. But I would say that our group is very focused on the public, in, in particular as a stakeholder across a number of different stakeholders. You know, we woke up and found ourselves one day uh, the topic of a lot of conversation, which is very unusual for Goldman Sachs. We don't particularly like to put ourselves in the limelight. And uh, it was a, a great awakening to the fact that there is this online conversation that's taking place 24 seven. You have to be aware of it, you have to listen to it, and as we came to realize, you have to participate in it. Otherwise, people will define who you are. And that's not necessarily the best strategy. And as a result, you know, we have really tried to focus on different ways to participate in that conversation in a value-added and brand-appropriate way. Um, and that has included starting to adopt some uh, presence in social channels. I would rate us a two. I think we're still uh, beginning, still learning, but very eagerly embracing uh, these channels and trying to determine how we can be relatable, how we can add value to conversations with, frankly, people who may never be a customer of Goldman Sachs, which is a very interesting challenge. Hi. Hi, everyone. Tatiana Howard, uh, Charles Schwab. I work on the, um, the B2B side of the house, so um, our business mainly works with um, registered investment advisors that custody um, with us, and we offer technology and uh, practice management services for them as well. And on the scale of one to five, um, I would give us a two. I think we're getting started. Um, we're out there pushing content, and as everyone, all the panelists have already said, engaging in the conversation. We're not quite there yet. Um, but you know, I think what we're trying to do is a mix of content that really fits and supports our brand for Schwab Advisor Services. So whether it be for influencers, clients, or prospects, really focusing on what would be relevant to each of those audiences and really doing a test and learn on that content as a starting point. You know, let's, let's actually uh, tee off of that to start with. When you talk, and there's so many of you on the panel are dealing with a B2B audience, which is very different than most conversations around social. So, uh, Tatiana, maybe talk a little bit about what does that mean when you're talking to this to, to an audience of professionals who are expecting certain things, where they expect to deal with you in a certain way, deal with Schwab in a certain way. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you um, how do you think about what kind of content to create for them, or how do you talk to them on the in these social channels? Sure, great. Um, I have a good example. You know, we I actually work in the acquisition side of the house, so we're trying to convert. Um, brokers, warehouse brokers, to go fully independent and go become registered investment advisors. So one example of our content that we share on LinkedIn is what does it mean to go independent and be an RAA? What are the benefits? Um, how are you helping your clients? Things like that. And to really make it relevant for them and remembering that businesses are people. 
Um, so we have to talk to people and um, making it real and also um, having current clients, people who have gone through the process, tell the story on video is very meaningful and very real. And are you finding that you can get people to talk back? That you are asking the kind of content, you're, you're giving them the kind of content that they will engage with? Yeah, I mean, great question. I think we're getting started. We're yeah. seeing some likes and some shares and um, uh, not a lot of engagement yet, but we're, um, we're hoping for more, for sure. All right. Um, <clears throat> Michael, do you want to talk about that a little bit also, this, this B2B, why? Why reach out to B2B? What does it mean? Uh, how you think about it? Um, it? Yeah, I think if I look at B2C, B2B, B2B2C, which also exists, <laughs> um, I think B, B2B is, is the difficult one. Uh, and if, if I think now from, from, from my perspective, we call that our intermediaries business, where we, have, uh, where we deal with companies and corporates as well. And, um, it really comes down to not being the company that talks to a person, and that's actually something that was on this Twitter feed outside. It's, it's, you need to talk to them as if it's a person, because you, even though it's a company, it's a person, you deal with that person, you want to intrigue them, you want to provide them with content that's relevant to them. And in, in instances, sometimes it's actually not the owner of a company that we, we want to influence, but it's actually the person behind that person. Uh, and I can, I can translate that into the B2C space then as well. It could be the wife who influences uh, somebody, but in this case, it could be a personal assistant or somebody in the team who is actually influencing uh, a business owner. So we want to ensure that when we deal with them uh, and when we engage with them, um, it's not us broadcasting information out, but the ultimate goal is for us to have a meaningful two-way conversation and to understand at what point do we need to take it offline. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that idea too of having a voice. You're not just reaching, you're talking about reaching out to individuals on the other side, but you're also, you have, I don't know who's doing your, your social, but these are, do you talk to the world as a bank or do you talk as individuals talking to the world? What's the strategy for the voice of, the, of, of, your, of your company? At TD Ameritrade, um, so we have a couple of businesses. We have a trader business. We have a long-term investor business and the RIA business, similar to what Tatiana described. And in the trader business, we have a, a lot more license. If you think about Jill, Jill was a professional trader. That business, um, you know, we're marketing to people like Jill who are managing their investments on their own. So we have a lot more license as a brand to infuse humor. To, to be human and um, to talk about, to simplify the technical, but still, um, still really being edgy. And we do that in our magazine called Think Money. Mm -hmm. And that translates into our experts program where we brought two influencers within the trading business where they engage in social media and they bring that edginess that comes from that side of the business and their personal um, So these brand. are outsiders who are the, speaking for you? These are TD Ameritrade so Associates okay. who are allowed to engage on Twitter in the social space. And what they've done is they've um, adopted the edginess of the, of the brand, but also infused their own personality. So like Nicole Sherrod, is a uh, head of product strategy. She talks about um, fashion. She'll talk about um, you know, uh, you know, trade strategies and the products and capabilities, but she does it in a personal way. She'll, like when we introduce mini options, for example, her tweet would say, you know, I like my heels high and my options mini. So she's infusing her, you know, her personality, kind of the brand's personality, and she's getting interactions that way. That's great. I, th I think it's important for um, however you approach social, to have a brand voice. However, whatever voice you set for social should ladder up to your corporate brand house and you know, be appropriate though for the medium in which you're, you're doing. How you might engage on Facebook might be very different than how you engage on LinkedIn because the consumer's in a very different mindset. So understanding the mindset is so important for how you tailor the message. Well, you know, we serve, a, have a very broad consumer business. We have small business owners, we have individual investors, we have credit card customers. Uh, my team, 
manages the social presence that supports that breadth of, of consumer audience. And we make sure everything is aligned to the brand and have very clear examples of what that voice is. But we also uh, write um, articles and blogs in our first person. So our employees are talking about their personal financial challenges and struggles. We feel that's incredibly important to create authentic engagement and not just hide behind a corporate logo. And each of us has, you know, who loves fashion, who may be passionate about um, volunteerism, that we bring that personality in it as just a way of showing the diversity of interest, but also to reinforce that when we come to work every day, we're dealing with the same challenges that our, our customers. And, you know, how are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to save for retirement? How are you going to juggle everything? And by being open and showing some of the vulnerabilities, we think that has built incredible trust and also given us more license and makes us part of the, the consumer's trust circle because they're seeing that they identify with us as individuals and that helps humanize the brand. Right. And Lisa, I think this, this is a great question. This is a, one I think a lot of people are wondering about with Goldman is how do you do that? Are you, how much do you reveal of Goldman? Goldman is always under such scrutiny and people have certain opinions about it. What, 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 I know you guys are at a two, but what are you thinking right now? You, you know, it's, it's, it's funny to be from a, a brand where, for a long time, Mystique was our, one of our strongest brand <laughs> assets. You know, and in, in a social world, it is um, interesting to really think about how to still maintain some of that, but at the same time, add elements that are authentic, that are um, humanizing. Because if you ask the people of, of Goldman Sachs why they are so proud of being at Goldman Sachs. Often it's because of the people that they get to work with and the talent they're surrounded by and, and the way that that challenges them, et cetera. Our challenge has been, how do we bring that to the outside and do that with an audience that we're not in regular contact with? It would be one thing if we were talking about communicating with our clients. We know a lot about that. We, we have a lot of ability to predict what might be of interest to them, how to serve that up, et cetera. But we've had to really do a ton of research and a lot of imagining as to how we can be credible and how we can be authentic. And a lot of our content relates to explaining who we are, what we do, and why it matters, and how that ultimately is relatable to them. And so we've had to really think about how to find a voice that meets all of those criteria, but at the same time still feels like Goldman. And there are some you know, points at which we just kind of get the hunch that, hmm, this doesn't feel like us anymore. But we keep pushing ourselves further to um, really emphasize those things. Can you talk about what, and I'd like for all of you to answer this, what you do in t as you prepare, as you go down this road, <clears throat> how are you uh, getting employees on board? What is the, are there policies in place? First of all, how do you tell employees what they can be saying and, and get them either to say things that you want them to say or teach them what they can say on their own? And then in a second, we'll also talk about how you get, go up the ladder and get buy-in from the senior executives to believe in, in this as, as, as an idea that they need to, to get behind. Great question. So first of all, for, for the people, um, the employees, um, we have social media policies for all employees. And then if, um, for example, on LinkedIn, we're using our salespeople as brand ambassadors. So they're, they're in their own pilot program with their own policies and procedures um, that we've negotiated with um, compliance and legal. And they become, not only are they sharing our content and they're enhancing their network and really having a brand of their own, but they're also our advocate for our brand and enhancing it and amplifying it. Um, and one of the things that we, we do want to do at Schwab overall is have more of an employee ambassador program. Um, so we take that to the next level and we have more employees actually supporting and influencing and sharing the brand and the content. Um, to answer the second part of your question, um, it's interesting, um, you know, Eileen actually mentioned about the naysayers in the organization and she, I asked her a question, how many naysayers did you have? And, you know, I think at Schwab we had, we've had kind of a wave, it's like it started off, you know, real, you know, people are, what is social media? You know, we don't want to be there and then it's really kind of ramping up and I found if you talk to people one-on-one -on -one at the C-suite and explain and have them understand the brand, the content and the benefit, um, for salespeople, it's leads, it's appointments, it's um, you know bringing money and new business into the company. So I think if you if you paint the picture of the results, 
um, that helps as well. So it's an RO when you're looking when, when you're talking up, it's you talk about ROI. When you're talking down, you're talking about building out networks and relationships. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll just add to that, one, yeah. and I'll I'll answer your second question uh -huh. first um, because I I, I I one of the things that is most fascinating to me, and I'm sure many of you in the audience and on the panel can relate, is you know you realize that you're you're talking to um, senior management who work you know, incredibly hard, incredibly long hours, spend most of their time in the office, yet they're sitting in front of you know, a computer or whatever it might be that's firm issued that because of regulatory reasons will not allow them to access the very social media platforms that you're trying to get mm -hmm. them to, to understand. And so you immediately start with a bit of a, a, a disadvantage mm -hmm. um, because you know, in order to learn the platforms best, you really have to be on them. And so if you're not allowed to be on them in the place where you spend the most of your time, you know, you're not necessarily going to be the most savvy about them. And so um, we've had to really think of ways to make these platforms come to life for people, both to explain how they're important to our clients and to stakeholders. Um, sometimes the best way to get through to someone is if they've either had an experience or are planning to have an experience with their kids who are using these mm -hmm. platforms. That sometimes is a, a great, you know, relatable moment. But one of the things that we've found to be most successful, and, and I highly recommend it, is to embrace kind of a reverse mentorship uh, policy, whereby, um, if possible, the junior most people who tend to be the, the most um, accustomed to and native with all of the digital and social platforms have the opportunity to be a mentor on those things to a senior person at the firm. And that is a tremendous exposure opportunity for them that they probably normally wouldn't get with such a senior person. And for the senior person, it is you know, a terrific way to be able to, in a relatively risk-free manner, embarrassment-free manner, be able to ask questions whenever they want to a person who's very eager to uh, provide information. So you know, everybody ends up feeling like an expert and like they're contributing. And that's been a tremendous educational effort. I would say, though, that as far, far as the employees at large go, particularly for us when we've done some things that have been very new, really embracing uh, the employees as advocates, to your point, mm -hmm. whether you have a formal brand ambassador program or not, is such an important investment. First of all, from a morale perspective, they're so excited to see that the firm is doing things uh, along the lines of what you know, we and, and, and everyone else is doing. I'm sure it's the same. And then otherwise, you know, nobody likes to feel like they don't know. Or nobody likes to feel like they're they're left out, and nobody likes to feel particularly confused. Everybody, you know, particularly in our industry, really tries to do the right thing by policies and rules. So trying to um, find the right channels in which to have conversations, so that the um, employees really understand and can feel equipped to uh, be expert on all the different things that are going on and have a place to go if they want to learn more about it, is such an important investment and has a, a huge return in so many ways. Great. Michael? I would actually um, echo what, what you just said. Just maybe I can underpin that with an example that we had just recently where we embarked onto a proof of concept to try to allow our staff to actually use Twitter and LinkedIn and Pinterest and access it from their work computer. So the first ta task of force was get these people whitelisted was quite interesting because I met people who I didn't know existed in Jersey City and in Singapore and all the, so that was fantastic. The other bit is around um, how do you involve compliance, legal risk. I mean, they have a job which they do beautifully. So when I come in with my great ideas from a marketing perspective, I need to be maybe reined back. That's fine. However, what we did is we included them. So as part of the proof of concept, we um, got some people from compliance and risk and the IT department to actually uh, participate, to tweet on our behalf. So um, we did that in the UK with Twitter, and we did that here in the US with IRs uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, it was the best proof of concept that I would have say uh, I've ever had, because it was really, really eye-opening that it was not just about the solution and pushing for a solution, trying to do the best thing, but actually internally to educate staff, to get people on board. And what we're going to do now is to try to actually make the case also for our senior management, and not just in the division in which I work, but also across Barclays as a group, because as a, as a universal bank consisting of retail, corporate banking, 
Barclay card is a credit card business or wealth or investment bank even, the former Barclays Capital, um, there are different challenges in each of these divisions. So trying to share the learnings within the company is incredibly important and everybody has a different story to tell. But if we bring this all together, which is something we're doing actually right now, to as across, across the group of Barclays to come together to share these learnings and to have one policy for Barclays, not multiple, uh, have a policy that set uh, in conjunction of, uh, from, from people that come from Barclays, uh, from marketing, from risk, from legal, all over the world, trying to ensure that we speak as one voice. And that links back to your brand question, that when we engage with clients, they see us as Barclays, uh, not Barclays Wealth, which was our own uh, our old uh, sub-brand, but as Barclays. And, and it's really important that we continue doing this. So, as we're going through a lot of change at the moment, um, this is actually a really good example of us where we try to show a little bit of stewardship and ensure that we bring people together to, to actually take social media a step further. Great. And Linda, I know you and I have talked about this quite a bit, but if you could walk through uh, you know, how you got buy-in and, 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 and what you've been doing, that'd be great. Well, like many of you, um, City is a very numbers-driven culture and with uh, a, a quite a number of senior managers who are not for the reasons Lisa mentioned, using social on a regular basis. So for us, it was creating um, a framework and a measurement system that really translated social metrics and social language into more commonly understood um, marketing metrics and showed how social could support both paid, owned, and earned tactics. So we, we you know, created this ecosystem model that showed how this is part of an overall marketing and communication plan, not something that's so different. It's just another channel, the way you might have print or broadcast, and then translate it, the reach and the awareness um, in very traditional marketing language, and that helped us. And by focusing a lot on metrics, it almost gave us some relief because what senior managers like to know is something is being measured. They may not quite understand whether it's you know, a good measurement or not, and we just explained where we are from a benchmarking standpoint. The other thing we were able to do is build a close partnership to legal and compliance to a point that Michael made. We, we went from having meetings to forums because in a forum everyone comes with their thinking cap on and the idea is what's the shortest path to yes. Mm -hmm. But by bringing them in from the ideation stage, that helped us build trust and then going back and demonstrating that we were following the rules. And even if we do a Twitter party or a Google Hangout, they may listen in so that it's not as mysterious and use them as advocates. Great. Yeah, getting buy-in is so important. Um, you, on the compliance front, we were very fortunate a couple years ago, we, on the advisor side, had a social media lab, and it was our advisors who were pushing us, asking us about social media, and um, we created a social media lab at a conference. LinkedIn was there, there were um, consultants there, and we made sure compliance was there as well to advise the advisors on how to engage in social media. What that did was it also created a connection with the compliance team and the um, and social media, and they and they were helping advisors think through it. And of course, they were naturally thinking about it for TD Ameritrade. At the um, at the senior levels, there were two key executives running businesses who were also passionate about social media for their business. One was the advisor had, and the other was uh, the guy responsible for the trader business. So it's, it's also making sure, for me, it was aligning with them and testing some things in their business so that I had advocacy at the top. And then also for the CEO, it's about, you know, he, his job is to look forward. So he understands the, the demographics. He understands the trends. So he got it, even though he wasn't engaging in it. And it really helped. Uh, another tipping point was we, um, I facilitated a social media a session at our leadership meeting. And so when I was able to read out, you know, and people were engaging in the fact that we really need to do it, it's how. We, we had a policy for all associates and we, we said that we would do this in a very controlled way. And for the experts, you know, I kept saying, even though they were talking about option strategies, which as a broker dealer, FINRA regulated broker dealer, that freaks compliance out. It, it freaks me out, you know, I'm not a, uh, a, a complex, you know, options or derivatives trader, but the, um, 
you know, I, I kept saying, you let them talk on CNBC. They know they're wired as registered reps mm -hmm. who are industry professionals. They know how to talk about a market dynamic and the implications of, you know, a, of a trade strategy without giving advice. What makes you think that when they go to the keyboard that the hard wiring of their, you know, 20-year career is going to somehow change? Marketing will give them guidelines, but, you know, we've um, and, it, and it really worked to kind of tell that story and to roll it out in a very controlled way. What was compliance's answer to that question, CNBC versus, you know, social? They, they, they had to think about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're like, okay, we know that, that um, you know, we're, they're just going to have to work with us. So it, it reframed to not a no. It, it was, okay, let, we're going to help you and um, give guidelines and things like that. It's not perfect. There are still times when I, I look at things and I'm a little, uh, you know, like uh, freaked out about it. But we're, um, you know, we're, we're working on training these experts and rolling out in a very controlled way with compliance engaged in the process. And I think to a point you made, I think what compliance is often concerned about in social is that it feels like it's in perpetuity mm -hmm. rather when, than when you're on TV or radio. However, what they forget is today, if you're on radio or TV, generally, yeah. right, the links are being put on Sorry. that channel's website. Right. So it really is, yes, is no different. And that's part of what you have to remind them of. Yep. I, I just wanted to share one other thing um, that, that might be useful. Uh, for others as well. You know, one of the biggest challenges in um, trying to propose doing something new, whether it's, uh, you know, establishing a presence on a platform for the first time or taking the next step and actually trying to have a dialogue on a platform that you might have a presence on, uh, is, you know, it's so easy to think about maybe the, the 10 reasons as to why doing any of those things would be risky. Everyone's really good at coming up with that list of risks and can come up with them relatively quickly. It's a robust list. And one of the things that um, my team and I found was that we weren't really conveying and encouraging uh, people we were trying to get buy-in from to think about the risk of not doing something. Because you know, if there's a conversation about you that's taking place and you decide not to have a presence, guess what? That's a risk too. And by um, pointing that out and showing specific examples, uh, we were able to do things like, you know, um, set up a, a, a company page on LinkedIn or set up um, a, our own brand channel on YouTube because there's a consequence to not doing it. There's a risk to not doing it. And I think making that argument eventually resonates and is scarier than all the 10 risks that they might have come up with otherwise. <laughs> and then one other thing I just would want to emphasize is, um, you know, the, the tremendous benefit in uh, bringing compliance and legal and other um, technology risk, uh, various members of um, uh, you know, your human capital management organization into these dialogues early rather than getting to a point where you're, you're eager to rush something out and, and asking them to learn something or climb up a curve or deal with tricky issues that aren't, there aren't many precedents for uh, at the last second. I'm very lucky because I happen to have been, before taking on this role, the chief operating officer of legal compliance and audit at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> <laughs> and so who knew? You know, who would have thought that uh, these two roles would be so relevant? But never has there been a time when they're more relevant. So it was very easy for me to gather people who already knew me well, who trusted me. And um, we all thought it would be fun to work together and establish a working group where we're all learning together, where they're involved at the very beginning of the process, and, and thus we can all get to a comfort level together. And so there's a tremendous benefit to uh, in inviting them in as partners early on. That's yeah. great. I would just I would echo that. We, um, we recently did a social media summit where we got legal compliance, all the channel owners together ac across the company to really talk through key issues. And an example would be sharing third-party content. How are we going to tackle all this? across the company and have one policy and really move forward. And I think a, a, to all of you, I think getting everybody together is key and building that trust. Um, and then on the, on, I wanted to echo what you said on the, um, if you don't do it, I mean, it, it's your brand. You have to be relevant in the social space. You have to be up on YouTube and LinkedIn and you're missing the boat, you know, competitors are, Paul down there is uh, <laughs> <laughs> take all our business. <laughs> um, that's terrific. I, you know, I want to make sure we have time for, for, for questions. So if there, if you have any, raise your hand and we will walk around with microphones. And if you could identify yourself before you ask your question, that'd be great. We have a question right up here in the front. Can we go ahead? Yeah, uh, it's Patrick Baines with PeopleLinks. What, what do you say to the regulators or the compliance team when 
or anyone when they say it's, it's already happening, right? So they're already on LinkedIn and they're already on social. Uh, what do you, what's your like, commentary on that? So wait, it's a question that the compliance team would, 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 would push back and say, why do we need to have a policy? Because everyone's already on it? Yeah, so you, know, you have to make a choice to start and to bring compliance in, right? But isn't some of this already occurring? Oh, you mean with like with individual employees? With employees. Right. Yeah. Well, we uh, at Schwab we have a corporate social media policy that you know defines what employees are supposed to be doing. So they can't really say that because it's already been defined. And so taking it to the next level is you know having a brand presence and communicating and having a defined program. Um, they they've worked and partnered with us on those. Yeah. Has anyone else here taken someone who was a um, <clears throat> either someone who has a large following or? doing great work on social media already and turning them into an ambassador for the brand if you had that happen where you had internal stars? Well, I mean, I guess I could cite myself as one example because um, my team has special permission to actually write in first person uh, blogs and articles that are not only published on city-owned properties, but we have permission to syndicate that content through um, other high-reach publishers, including LinkedIn. And LinkedIn had invited me to join the influencer program, and I, you know, and while I'm authorized um, to write on behalf of City, my LinkedIn pieces were under my own name, and I did have to get special permission and have rules of the road in terms of what would be appropriate or not appropriate. And I still have my personal post go through a compliance review process, but that's part of the the right I have, and because City comes with me, and it's understanding. Today, when you're in social, your personal and your professional brands are blurred. It's very hard. So part of the opportunity is to recognize the responsibility that my brand carries on to City, but City also follows me. So those are new opportunities, and those are part of the things we just raise up and figure out how to handle. It's not yet scalable, but that's part of think what we aspire to do is to follow what some of our my other panelists have said about having a broader brand ambassador program and outlining what are those, how do you make those lines less blurry? So, so I'll, I'll add to that if, if it's okay, and I, I hope this is relevant to your question. Um, you know, so we all spent a lot of time putting together an updated policy that incorporates the latest forms of uh, communications, including social media, et cetera. And the, the, the natural tendency was just, OK, let's put this policy into the monthly policy release. And people will find it. And that goes to everybody. And you know, just use very traditional roots of, of putting that policy out into uh, dissemination across the company. Well, I think you know, one of the things that we have realized uh, and, and have been trying to advocate and continue a dialogue on, particularly as you think about you know, junior people coming in for summer internships and all sorts of things, is you can't just put that policy out and uh, you know, uh, let's assume that everyone's going to find it. You need to have conversations because these types of behaviors and, and habits and tendencies are the new reality. And you need to help people understand the context in which they can do something and they cannot do something. Or they can do it through the firm, or they have to do it through their own personal channels. Or even if they do it through their personal channels, that there are things that they shouldn't be doing to um, somehow get connected to uh, what could be interpreted as a message from the firm. You need to have dialogue around that. You can't just put out that policy. And you need to have an ongoing dialogue so that the questions that you can't predict now, but maybe in you know, six months will be the new set of questions, can then be discussed. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's take some more questions. Back here. Hi. Um, you all mentioned using social for particularly brand or referring to how your brand works, et cetera. I think one of you mentioned that it's a lead generation for some advisors. Are there any additional metrics or usages that you see for social? other than um, addressing more of the brand of the company and would love to hear how you so, guys are doing it. Paul? So our, um, our, what's core to our social strategy is to inspire and educate investors or traders to become better. And um, the, part of the, the heart of the, the social media strategy is to take the great content that already exists and bring that into social so it gets out more broadly. 
we still struggle with connecting followers and you know, um, to assets and accounts. But when we're communicating to taking the content and communicating it to clients, we look, we can actually see that there is trade lift and accounts and assets. And that's what we zero in on to, to kind of prove the ROI. But it's still. As it relates to taking the content and relaying it to clients and then tying it that way. Th this is exactly why we hired an agency to really help figure out the social piece to accounts and assets. And if anyone has figured that out, please <laughs> see me. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. trying Michael, to. I'd actually be curious what your, what your experience has been on this. Um, are you asking me? I'm sorry. No, sorry, asking Michael. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. So <laughs> it's an interesting one. So we yeah. try to do exactly what Paul is doing, but um, I, I would still say if I were to look at it as a maturity curve, where are we on that particular curve? We're neither there, we're hopefully not there anymore. So I still see us as early adopters trying to be a little bit disruptive, try to experiment. Mm -hmm. um, so a key metric for us is something which um, we came up with is try to plot what content do we have out there, be it our blogs, our Twitter feeds, be it our Facebook pages, LinkedIn profiles, our Pinterest, et cetera, et cetera. And we also try to understand what's the connection in, within this ecosystem between them. So how can we then go back to our uh, flagship website? So how can we follow traffic back to there? How can we follow, how, how do people consume our content? And how can we see um, how strong connections are? So for instance, we have a publica publication called Insights, which is thought leadership for, for high net worth clients, uh, where we see a very strong relationship between our website as well as that particular uh, piece of content that we, we, we use predominantly now also on, on um, in, in collateral, of course, but also on, on LinkedIn. And it is quite ins uh, insightful for us to actually now understand the behavior a little bit as how do our clients and customers want to consume our content. So while that is the ultimate goal for us, absolutely, we are still at that stage right now where we're trying to understand we've got this wealth of content out there, um, white papers, all that stuff, research, fantastic stuff. Um, when we try and, does it make sense to just digitalize it? I don't know. And if we do it, do we do it in, in other ways? And if I can give you an example of how we try to uh, understand this ecosystem. We had um, last year an event called Open Outcry, where we try to um, educate our clients about the concept of trading. So it was an opera. We invited actors and, of course, our head of behavioral finance to the London Stock Exchange, um, and we mimicked that whole behavior. Well, they were singing trades, and the, the actors were actually paid on the success at the end, which was also quite interesting. <laughs> but it was what was really what was really interesting. It was one of the most interesting pieces of content that we created about a very abstract topic that can be incredibly dry. And we engage a lot of people and it, it created a lot of hype for us and a lot of buzz on, 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 on YouTube. So um, for us, it's really around right now, help us understand how we can use content and we'd love to le learn more about our clients' behavior there. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you want to add something? Sure. I mean, the way our focus for the first phase of our, our social effort has been on top funnel. So how can we widen our reach? and how can we drive engagement and then consideration of our brand. And we absolutely see a link between content and brand consideration and preference, which is very important for us. I mean, to us, you have to build the love, you have to build the trust before you can begin to look at mid-funnel and down-funnel efforts. But we are now at a point where we're testing and learning about could we acquire new customers, could we drive online spend on our credit cards, uh, but we're just at those early stages. We've also looked at content not from a, just a brand, but can, is content um, creating an amplification? Is it creating a ripple effect that will spark conversations beyond our properties? And so we call that amplification. And we have found over the past year a tremendous extension of reach through content marketing because of sharing, because it's also seeding new content created by bloggers and other influencers that are carrying our key messages to even broader audiences. So it, you know, if we have a very constrained paid media budget, this is really supporting that same reach, um, which is, has been powerful.
Great. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add for, for our salespeople, they're actually tracking prospect connections, appointments, dollars in the door. So that's one of the, I mean, it's very narrow for sales. And, you know, I would agree with all of my panelists on the brand and all of the engagement. But for salespeople, it's bringing in new business. Great. And we do track that. We have time, I think, for about two more questions. Let's see. Go ahead. You can just, I'll, I'll repeat it. You can just say that loud. Now we all have established social media. Pre Thank you, uh, Andrew Jenkins from our company. Now that you all have established social media presence, I'm wondering if you can speak to how your content strategy might help you mitigate or counter any reputational management issues. All right. So, how do you use social to stop your to stop and advance your your broader content strategy? How do you use it to help you mitigate or counter any reputational issues that might arise? All right. Anyone want to take on that one? No. Well, <laughs> okay. do you, do you, uh, I mean, I think what we've tried to do with content is really go. It, it goes back to the, the customer and consumers. What are some of the pain points uh, in their everyday financial lives? What are the topics that are of concern to them? And then creating content that speaks to those topics, and not just you know making it available on our website, but sharing it through publishers, through bloggers and being at the table and being willing to tackle some of those conversations in an additive way so it's not pitching our product. But you know, we've partnered with publishers from Real Simple to LinkedIn to uh, parenting to look at things like back to school shopping and how you can turn that into a teachable money moment or on holiday shopping and how do you get more for less and how do you deal with all the stress around the holidays. And I think by bringing new ideas and insights that are contributing and making, we like to say, take the friction out of someone's life. That has earned a lot of goodwill. And it also gives people the reason to listen to us and, and think through when we are facing reputational issues. Okay, so it's um, more, it's more, defi it's more uh, it's planning that, goodwill the rather trust than trust and building the goodwill okay. and that people will listen to your messages differently. Great. Go in the back here. Hi. Um, I just feel as though I need to clarify something. Uh, earlier, it was said that um, they were comparing uh, written communications with um, uh, public appearances, like on CNBC or something. They're not the same. Uh, stranger things have come out of Washington, but the regulators treat written uh, communications quite differently from verbal communications. So public appearances under the securities rules only really require training and and that's it and and noting who appeared when yeah. uh, whereas written communications have um, other requirements record keeping uh, also some other requirements about filing and and so forth so it's a little bit more complicated than yeah. that it, it's a lot more complicated and th thank you for for clarifying that the the three experts that we have at TD Ameritrade were selected for a reason the um, on the institutional side, it's the, um, it's, his name is Skip Schweiss, and he works with our general counsel on advancing our advocacy on the fiduciary standard. So he is hardwired to uh, represent us as a broker dealer about the fiduciary standard. So th my, um, my passionate example of selling the uh, you know, talking about options on CNBC and Skip. When I was talking to senior people at Compliance, they understood that these people have that hard wiring to channel the risk and representing the, the brand. And so that really helped. Um, but you're absolutely right. It is a lot more sophisticated. And I think it's important to also know some topics are not appropriate to discuss in Twitter the way right. you might discuss them in a different forum and having that level of editorial guidance. Correct. Great. Well, right in the middle in the back there. It's hard to look back there. Look Thank you. Um, wondering if uh, you have a plan to deal with a crisis, especially those who have several individuals who are speaking on behalf of them. How do you, do you have people who are, who are ready to, to jump in if it's no, like a crisis? Do you have a plan? Yeah, exactly. Do you have a plan to deal with a, a crisis on yeah. social media? Great. Okay. So um, I think uh, from a Barclays perspective, it might be suitable uh, if I talk about the last months, the last 12 months is interesting. Um, so if you think about financial crisis, LIBOR crisis, that you, you realize how important uh, social media risk policy is. So what do you do? 
if, if something happens um, that, that is incredibly newsworthy. And there it is for us uh, now uh, a given fact that we do have such a policy. Uh, and uh, what is interesting there is, and, and I, I would like to link that back to the question that was asked uh, previously about online reputation, because it's completely, of course, uh, interlinked. Um, for us, it is about ensuring that we react appropriately. So when somebody posts something that's negative, you don't just leave it out there. So try to engage with clients and customers as well. So if they have something to say that's negative of you, we need to understand, of course, what is it. And if you think about can you identify key influencers, and oftentimes it is journalists, for instance, that say something negative, and as Jill said uh, this morning, they do like to talk about negative things. Uh, it, is really, it is really important that you, you, you take that as an opportunity. And a, a crisis is only worthwhile if you make the best out of it. So um, if you think about online reputation, now, in that context, um, a couple of words or a buzzwords were mentioned earlier today. Circle of trust. Um, it's a person, it's not a company. And uh, the financial crisis, I think, has shown us that it really comes down to just that. You want to engage with your clients and customers, prospects in meaningful ways. And depending on their level of sophistication, where they are in their life stage, um, they want to, you know, do business with a company or a bank that shares values with them. So if you react appropriately and you do something wrong, you admit it and you talk about it in meaningful ways and you pull in the people that you need to pull in to actually address that. So from, from our perspective, it is incredibly interesting and important. And um, if I think of now about wealth investment management, where I sit, uh, given the, this huge uh, spectrum of clients and customers, it's incredibly important that, that we, that we uh, adhere to this policy and that we do this. And it's really ingrained in everybody, at least in my team, who manages social media, that uh, we're very proactive. And if there's a negative post, then of course we react appropriately. And we need to take it offline if we need to take it offline. That's great. You know, <clears throat> we are out of time, but I really want to thank you all. And I just want to do a quick wrap up, make sure that we've got everything right that we talked about. Basically, when talking to your company, buy-in sounds incredibly important. Getting compliance involved early or having your chief compliance officer become your social media person. Um, you want to look at the uh, at the ROI of or the um, or the, the reputational risk of not participating in social media. That's in incredibly important. And then thinking about the numbers that you're, you're you start at the top of the funnel and then figure out how the bottom of the funnel looks a little bit later. So, thank you all. This is really fascinating. Appreciate you coming. Thank you.